1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Dr. John Stewart, who's the Chief of Surgery at the Duke Veterans, I mean at the Durham Veterans Administration Hospital, as well as he's a member of the faculty in the Division of Advanced Onco Oncologic and Gastrointestinal Surgery, I can barely pronounce that, Department of Surgery at Duke University Medical School, and um, he is I'm also glad to mention that he is on the ed Educational Advisory Board for the Biomedical Engineering Program and the ERC. And he has supported us for the last three years, and we look forward to many more years of his support. And he's actually referring us to one of his former students who's on the faculty at Wake and will be one of our future speakers. What's her name, Dr. Stewart? Nicole Polyachinko. Wonderful, wonderful. We're looking to have hosting her in the, in the future. And uh, <clears throat> Dr. Stewart has a zoology BS from Louisiana Tech and an MD from the Howard University School of College of Medicine. And he's had uh, multiple residencies in surgery and, of course, uh, oncology at NCI, Temple University, Vanderbilt, and so on. Multiple honors, of course. And uh, <clears throat> we're looking forward to hear him talk about what he has to say on uh, the use of viruses in uh, cancer treatment. I also like to give a sh special shout out to 
uh, future Dr. Stewart, if you'd like to introduce him, John. So I have uh, Kobe with me. He's in eighth grade. Uh, doesn't really get to see me lecture much, so this is this is a this is a big deal. Um, although my wife could probably recite this lecture by now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pot. So it's always an opportunity, a great opportunity to come back to A and T uh, to speak to the students, particularly in biomedical engineering. I know many of you saw that I went to Louisiana Tech, which is one of the first biomedical engineering programs um, in the country. So it was a special place for me. And in fact, one of my partners in uh, comparative anatomy was a BME major. Also, Dr. Pai uh, noticed that I um, I went to Howard, so yeah, that's my MEAC allegiance. You won't hold it against me, though, please. All right, so this afternoon, we'll, uh, or this morning, I guess, as Dr. Pai mentioned, I guess I'll be the last speaker of the current um, administration. Um, we'll speak on the uh, treatment of uh, M51R vesicular stomatitis virus as a treatment for metastatic colorectal cancer. Now, we know that um, colorectal cancer has a higher incidence in the African American community than it does in, um, in the general population. We do know that patients tend to be diagnosed at a later stage of disease and subsequently have poor outcomes. Current chemotherapy regimens include platinum therapies um, to break DNA. Um, to in order to affect com outcomes from metastatic disease. Um, I've done some phase one trials looking at some of these platinum agents um, in the setting of peritoneal carcinomatosis. However, my research for the past 10 years has focused on a biologic agent, specifically vesicular stomatitis virus, as a treatment for colorectal cancer. So, why oncolytic viral therapy? I'll tell you that using viruses to treat cancer is not something that is new, and in fact, in 1900, the first, excuse me, 1910, the first report of oncolytic viral therapies, in other words, viruses that recognize cancer cells and blow them up, was first reported by Doc et al. Subsequent work on cervical cancer, leukemia, sarcoma, and colorectal cancer has, um, has really exploded. And um, over the past five years, we've actually um, had an oncolytic viral therapy approved for the treatment of malignant melanoma, which is a herpes virus, an attenuated herpes virus. Now, what is the logic between uh, logic for using oncolytic viral therapies for the treatment of cancer? So, what we do know is that during normal cellular homeostasis, proliferative signaling pathways, as is shown here on your right, and antiviral signaling pathways, as is shown on the left, are to be delivered. However, for molecular carcinogenesis, there's an upregulation of proliferative signaling pathways so that cancers can grow and you have a uh, predominance of uh, molecules such as um, epithelial growth factor, TGF-alpha, and platelet-derived growth factor at the expense of antiviral signaling, including interferon and interferon-stimulating genes. Thus, cancer cells have a pretty significant growth. They also are susceptible to oncolytic viruses. So as shown here in this cartoon, normal cells have intact antiviral signaling, and so when you have an infection, such as shown here with the red bullets, Interferon comes out and antiviral signaling pathways are activated, and so the index cell dies, but the surrounding cells are rescued from invasion by virus. On the other hand, tumor cells, when infected by viruses, as, the, as are indicated by the red dots, have defective antiviral signaling, and the viruses tend to propagate throughout the surrounding cells and tumors, and they subsequently die. So, as was illustrated, not only do cancer cells downregulate the antiviral signaling, but unfortunately cancer cells vary in their susceptibility to viruses. And so just because we have a sarcoma that might be susceptible to one oncolytic virus, that does not mean that it would be susceptible to another oncolytic virus. And there are many oncolytic viruses that have been tested and reported, including adenovirus, herpes simplex virus, which is the backbone for telemetry, which is the uh, melanoma virus that's currently uh, being used, influenza virus, rheovirus, vaccinia virus, and of course VSV. So why is VSV an attractive oncolytic viral agent? So number one, it's replication competent, and it's a selective oncolytic virus. In other words, because it is able to specifically recognize cancer cells that are defective in their antiviral signaling, it is selective, whereas normal cells, which I showed before, have intact antiviral signaling, reject the virus. There have been very few reported cases of illnesses associated with this, 
and the incidence of population exposure to VSV is very low. Therefore, most people do not have um, preformed antiviral antibodies against VSV. Kind of the biology of VSV is also very interesting in Mason and, and, and very attractive virus because it replicates in the cytoplasm. It doesn't integrate into the DNA. And there's no known transforming potential and there's no genetic recombination or reassortment. Now shown here is the, um, and we'll kind of walk through this. Um, I was warned that we don't have, because of reflective screens, don't have a great use of the pointer. But so what I've shown here are the genomes of the recombinant wild type virus and then the uh, M51R VSV virus. So we're going to use the M51R VSV virus because it has a methionine to arginine substitution at the 51 position of the M protein, which is a packaging protein. Now, because the M protein of recombinant wild type virus is intact, it actually shuts off host gene expression and then inhibits host antiviral responses. And so wild type M51R virus has a pretty significant neurotoxicity because it can go through the um, it can go through the optic tract and infect the brain of treated mice. On the other hand, recombinant M51R virus with the aforementioned substitution at the M position does not shut down host gene expression, and it actually induces host antiviral responses, and it makes it extremely attractive for treatment in the clinical setting. So, based upon these findings, we hypothesized. Again, coupled with my clinical interest in metastatic colorectal cancer and the surgical management of colorectal cancer, that colorectal cancer cells have defects in antiviral signaling that um, make them susceptible to oncolytic effects of VSV. So we approached this um, looking at two objectives in our first work. And the first objective was to determine the molecular basis for this differential sensitivity. And the second one was to test the efficacy of oncolytic VSV in animal models of colorectal cancer. Now, we um, initially used, as we will show later in this talk, immune deficient mice, and then we used syngeneic mice to really understand the immunologic underpinnings of the susceptibility. So, let's talk about the molecular basis for the differential susceptibility. Okay? Now, shown here are the three cell lines that we use to characterize sensitivity to colorectal cancer. First is RKO, which is about a 45-year-old cell line that was um, derived from acidic fluid for a patient with metastatic disease. And we know that it's P53 wild type, it's deficient in mismatch repair, and wild type KRAS. HCT116 and LOVO cell lines are both wild type and P53, deficient in DNA mismatch repair, and have mutated KRAS. Now shown here is a panel um, of the aforementioned cell lines, RKO, HCT116, and LOVO cell lines, in which we tested with increasing susceptible, with increasing um, doses of recombinant wall type. This is a smart word, huh? Yeah. Um, okay. With increasing doses of M51R virus, M51R um, and recombinant wall type viruses, shown here on the x axis and the percent of cell viability as determined by NTSA assays on the right for the, these three cell lines. So what you'll notice here is that the RKO cell lines, when treated with M51 and recombinant wild type viruses at 24 and 48 hours after infection, have significant reduction in um, viability. ATT116 does have a similar reduction but it's not as profound as that seen in RKO viruses, and LOVO viruses tend to be what we call resistant. So what we've identified here in this panel is, again, variations in susceptibility of the effects of both M51 and recombinant wild type vesicular stomatitis virus at 24 and 48 hours. So to recap, RKO will be labeled sensitive, HCT116 will be labeled intermediate, and LOVO cells will be labeled as resistant. We then sought to understand if these colorectal cancer cells support viral protein synthesis. In other words, do the viruses get into the protein machinery of these cell lines and continue to be produced and subsequently spread throughout um, infected viral colonies? And so what we looked at in these cell lines is we looked at L, G, N, P, and M proteins, okay, and the genomes of these uh, viruses at 4, 8, and 12 hours. 
So shown here is in protein synthesis, and what you'll see here is that these three cell lines were able to produce, produce in, protein, or in protein synthesis at 4, 8, and 12 hours, okay, in both uh, recombinant wild type and M51. Now, one thing that you will notice is that the M protein synthesis in the M51R virus is higher um, than the wild type. And that is because, again, the wild type virus, as I showed before, shuts down host protein synthesis. What you'll also notice is that when you look at host protein synthesis in total, is that the M51R virus has a higher rate of total protein synthesis relative to recombinant wild type. And again, that's because we mutated the M protein and allowed for us to have continuous protein synthesis in these cell lines. The next question, or the next issue that we wanted to understand is whether or not um, recombinant and M51R VSV were able to um, produce viral progeny throughout cultures in these cell lines. And again, we looked at recombinant wild type, HCT116, and lobo cell lines, and we saw that all of these cell lines, irrespective of sensitivity to uh, these viruses, were able to produce um, viral progeny. Now, one thing that is important about oncolytic viral therapy is understanding the role of interferon or antiviral signaling in um, blocking the activity of these viruses. So, if you'll remember in the beginning, we um, alluded to the fact that cancer cells have defective interferon signaling, primarily around interferon beta, and normal cells do not have defective interferon signaling. And so what we attempted in these in vitro experiments was to take a model and convert them from being interferon deficient to being interferon positive by introducing increasing doses of interferon in culture. Now, if you'll think back, we think that recombinant wild type viruses work by shutting down host protein synthesis. And so antiviral signaling is not really that important. Whereas in recombinant wild type viruses, we think that interferon signaling is extremely important. It leads to its viral selectivity. And if we are able to increase interferon production, then we would be able to prove that M51's primary activity is related to interferon signaling. So interestingly, in these slides, what we see is that when we produce, when we provide interferon, in these cell lines, what you'll notice is that you know the recombinant wild type viruses still continue to kill in the sensitive and intermediate sensitivity. They don't really kill in the lobo cell lines as was expected. However, when we give concentrations of interferon up to um, starting at about 32 units and as high as 800 units of interferon in culture, you'll see that there's abrogation of the cytolytic effects, cytolytic, cytolytic effects and the uh, sensitive and intermediate cell lines. Therefore, this supports our uh, thought that interferon signaling is indeed important in the M51R virus, and in fact, more so important than in recombinant wild type virus. So we then undertook some pilot studies to identify transcriptional determinacy sensitivity. In other words, looking at the gene products that will allow us to later determine biomarkers in our human work that would um, allow us to identify uh, which patients might benefit from M51R virus and which patients might not benefit from M51R PSV. So we did this using uh, cDNA microarray experiments. Admittedly, this is a technology that's going to um, be replaced by proteomics uh, approaches and next-gen sequencing that we're working on now at Duke. But what we did is we extracted um, mRNA from RKO, HCT116, and LOVO cell lines, and then we defined ratios of uh, difference, so um, we defined RKO uh, cell lines um, to look at signal intensity, and the RKO ratio was the LOVO to RKO, LOVO being the resistant cell line, RKO being the sensitive cell line, or HCT116 cell lines, again, the numerator being LOVO and the denominator being HCT116, and if there was a fourfold difference, either higher or lower, we considered that to be statistically significant, and if there's a p-value, um, of 0 0.01 or less, then we also determined that to be significant. And so again, those two levels of significance allowed us to identify which genes we were going to work on in future work. Okay? And then we took those genes that were over or underexpressed 
and then look for enrichment and canonical pathways using the um, ingenuity pathway analysis software. And just briefly, we saw that there were a number of uh, canonical pathways that were involved. Uh, TGF beta signaling was very important. Um, a number of these uh, signaling pathways that we've shown here have not been completely defined in terms of being um, extremely important, but future work will, will look at those, and again, our next-gen sequencing will allow us to further enrich these canonical pathways that are potentially important. So based upon this preliminary work on the molecular determinants of sensitivity, we can see the alkalic virus can definitely kill colorectal cancer cells, as was demonstrated using our panel of three uh, well-established colorectal cancer cell lines. We know that colorectal cells support both viral progeny and protein production, and that they can vary in their sensitivity to the oncolytic viral effect. And uh, this can be potentially controlled by, um, by canonical pathways that we identified. Now, the second objective of our work is to actually test the efficacy uh, and safety of oncolytic virus in animal models. Right? I mean, this is, this, is, this is the next step going from in vitro to in vivo to human trials. Okay? And so we did this as really about a two-part approach. So the first part was using immunodeficient xenograft models. In other words, the immune system wasn't really that intact, and so we, we, what we wanted to show was a correlation between our in vitro findings and in vivo findings. In other words, taking it from the glass to the animal. And then the second model are actually syngenetic models in which we had intact immune systems to really understand the interplay between oncolytic viral therapy and anti-tumor immunity and the induction of um, anti-tumor immunity by a virus. So let's talk about our xenograft experiments. I mean, these I thought were, were pretty interesting. So RKO cells, which were sensitive to oncolytic viral effects, were uh, injected uh, into um, the um, flanks of mice, and then they were treated with 5 times 10 to the 6 plaque forming units of um, M51R virus, and they were sacrificed at 21 days post-injection. And we um, actually measured growth of these tumors uh, throughout the 21 days. And what you'll see here is the y-axis, excuse me, the x-axis being days after injection with VSV, and uh, the y-axis being percent tumor growth. On the bottom with the triangles, you'll note that those animals that were treated with M51R virus had a flat growth pattern. In other words, we were able to keep those tumors in check, while those animals that were treated with mock intratumoral injections, i.e. saline, on um, on day one, excuse me, on day one, yes, had a pretty significant increase in their growth patterns, and this became statistically significant at day 14. Is there any reason why the error bars are so much bigger as you go? Because we had, because we had so many mice, and uh, honestly, the tumor volumes or the tumor growth varied so much. So, you know, we would have some that would like double in tumor in one day, right? And so as we continued to march that out, those differences in growth volumes really just kind of played out. Now, what I would say is that the interesting thing about all of this is that because of the tumor growth in the uh, M51R virus animals, you know, those, those were pretty tight. They were very tight. But again, when you talk about having uh, tumors grow out in 21 days in our mice, then you begin to have a lot of variability in growth. Right. So, as I alluded to before, we really want to understand the anti-tumor immunity complex of this. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a tumor immunologist, spent four days, or four years, excuse me, in D.C. understanding tumor immunology uh, with Steve Rosenberg back when tumor immunology wasn't cool. So, we uh, did a very interesting experiment in which we took mice. I'm sorry, this isn't showing very well, but I'll talk you through it. We took mice, and then we injected them with um, tumors on the right flank and the left flank, okay? And then we injected the right flanks of mice with M51R virus, okay? Now, of course, the obvious effect was, hey, will we be able to cause a tumor reduction in immunocompetent mice, okay? In immunocompetent mice. And, of course, the, the answer was probably going to be yes. But the second part of that is, with the left tumors that were not treated with any virus at all, were we able to see a distant effect on tumor, okay? So in other words, did treating tumors on the right side result in a reduction in tumor volume on the left untreated side, okay? Now, what are the 
possible ways in which this would happen, okay? So, you know, the obvious way would be, hey, maybe you had virus leach from the right tumor to the left tumor. Not so much. And we saw that that wasn't the case when we did special staining. But secondly, did we have the induction of anti-tumor immunity by treatment on the right tumor that caused us to have a reduction on the left side? This is called an obscopal effect, okay? And um, so luckily, just enough of this right side tumor showed up. Sorry again, this is probably a Mac to, to PC issue here. So on the um, right side, on the right side, we had uh, tumors, mice that were treated with mock injections, i.e. saline. And as expected, they had continuous growth of their tumor. We had mice that were treated with um, external beam radiation therapy in order to knock down their immune systems, and then treated with vesicular stomatitis virus. And uh, believe it or not, they continued to have growth of tumor that was almost identical to those animals that were treated with saline alone. So this again speaks to us that anti-tumor immunity probably had a significant impact of antiviral signaling in this or antiviral or anti-tumor treatment by the virus in this treatment model. We had animals that were treated with external beam radiation alone, and no vesicular stomatitis virus again had a nice tumor growth. And then we had animals that were, um, and then we had animals. Uh, that were treated with vesicular stomatitis virus. And again, over 22 days, we um, had a statistically significant difference in growth patterns, okay? So, at least in the index-treated tumor, VSV worked, right? It prevented the tumor from growing in mice with intact immune systems, okay? Now, on the contralateral side, or the right side, that had um, animals uh, that were not treated with tumor, we saw almost an identical effect, almost an identical effect. In other words, the treatments that we treated, or the index treatment, actually caused us to have a regression or a decrease in tumor growth on an untreated side, okay? Very important, very important, okay? So this shows that we were able to get a distant tumor effect. Now, how do we prove that there was some induction of immunity here, okay? As I mentioned before in slides that I didn't show here, we did immunostaining, looking at viral proteins on both the treated side, and of course it was there, but there was no evidence of having viral associated proteins in the untreated contralateral side, okay? Secondly, we saw that there was actually the induction of anti-tumor immunity after treatment of subcutaneous uh, tumors um, and splenocytes. So we know that in mice and humans, there is a lot the great production of, of immunity in the spleen, okay? And so what we did was that we treated mice um, on the, uh, we took, excuse me, we took the tumors uh, from mice and then we, um, and then we harvested the splenocytes and then we did a co-incubation model in which we uh, just looked at splenocytes alone, CT26 tumor cells alone, and then we co-incubated splenocytes in the mock animals, i.e. those that only got saline, um, and then we wanted to see if there was a production of interferon gamma. In other words, we co-incubated naive splenocytes with tumor cells. We did not get anti-tumor immunity, okay? Not unexpected, okay? But then when we co-incubated splenocytes from mice that were treated with the M51R virus with CT26 cells, we saw that there was a dramatic increase in the production of interferon gamma, and that is because those splenocytes from those mice actually started having a greater anti-tumor response. Okay. In other words, they have, there was almost like there was a vaccination effect. Okay. So the virus gets in to the tumor, it blows the tumor up, the tumor cells then load on to the immune cells and then create a systemic anti-tumor effect. Now, interestingly. When we treated um, mice, or when we looked at the splenico-incubated splenocytes of uh, mice with M51 infected CT26 cells, we also saw a dramatic increase in the production of interferon. And this, uh, to me, suggests that you not only have an anti-tumor immunity that's present in the splenocytes, but you also have an antiviral immunity that's present in the splenocytes. And so, you know, that was kind of our, our good positive control there to show 
that we were able to induce a nice hand touch in their immunity using animals. Now, how does this get to the clinic? Okay. What does this mean to us in a clinical setting? How can we apply it to save humans? Okay. Now, as I mentioned before, about 10% of patients who uh, have colorectal cancer will develop what's called what we call peritoneal carcinomatosis or peritoneal surface dissemination. This is where tumor. I, yeah, it just got interesting. Huh? I see. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is where tumor cells actually escape the colon or the appendix or sometimes the ovary, and then they spread throughout the abdomen. Okay, and so they'll plant in what we call the mesentery, which uh, carries the blood supply to the um, to the small bowel, and they also see them what we call the omentum, which is that fat layer, internal fat layer that overlies our intestines. Okay. Bad problem, okay, bad problem, and there aren't a lot of great treatments. Now, if we cut through the chase of these data that I show you here, the EVACAPE trial of about 371 patients um, who had peritoneal surface malignancy and did not go on to go therapy, the longest survival was six months, excuse me, the median survival was six months, the longest survival was four months, and that was one patient out of 370, and um, there, were, there were no five-year survivors, okay, bad problem bad clinical problems. Now, what are the treatment options right now? Okay. Well, there's supportive care in hospice, which basically means make your patient comfortable. There's palliative surgery, i.e. connect a couple of pieces of bowel together to prevent the patient from becoming um, obstructed. There's cytoreductive surgery, in other words, going in, taking out a lot of tumor, and closing the patient up. And then there's cytoreductive surgery, plus intraperitoneal chemotherapy, which is you know, where I had a significant uh, part of uh, my practice, I guess, about five years ago. Pretty onerous operations, 10, 12 hours of operations of, of taking things out, running warm chemotherapy through, and putting them back together. And oh, by the way, in colon cancer, there's no clinical evidence that cytoreductive surgery plus intraperitoneal chemotherapy improves your outcome relative to cytoreductive surgery alone. When I was a fellow at the National Cancer Institute in DC, we tried to do that trial. However, you were either firmly entrenched in the cytoreductive surgery camp, or you were entrenched in the cytoreductive surgery plus chemotherapy camp. And so that trial did not complete accrual. Um, there is a trial, however, in Europe that's asking that same question. Can we go in, take out a bunch of tumor, leave the patient alone, or take out a bunch of tumor and get warm chemotherapy in the abdomen? And does that improve survival? Um, that trial was due to be reported this spring. However, they had um, what we call a lower number of expected incidents in both arms, i.e. fewer people die <laughs> with cytoreductive surgery if you then expected, and fewer people died with cytoreductive therapy and um, hypodermic chemoperfusion. And so that trial's got to go on a little longer. Now, well, trade secret is if you look at all of the trials that compare one chemotherapy versus another, those survival curves lie right on top of each other, which would suggest that it's not really the chemotherapy that makes a difference. It's probably the cytoreductive surgery that makes a difference. And so there's a lot of room for improvement. Right? There's a lot of room for improvement. And so what got me to thinking about cytoreductive surgery plus oncolytic vesicular stomatitis virus is the fact that when you put, for cytoreductive surgery and intraperitoneal chemotherapy, you run chemotherapy through an abdomen for 90 minutes, you rinse it out, and then you call it a day. Okay? The use of biologic agents, with vesicular stomatitis virus being one of them, you actually instill the virus into the abdomen, you can let it stay until the virus dies off, which is a number of days. You not only kill residual tumor cells, but you also induce the anti-tumor immune response that we alluded to before. And so this to me I think is an attractive, uh, an attractive approach. All right. Now, if we think about current therapy, you know, we know that, you know, as I mentioned before, 10 to 15 percent of these patients are going to present with uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis. You know, if you've got peritoneal carcinomatosis versus lung disease versus liver metastases. Peritoneal carcinomatosis does worse with chemotherapy than to the other diseases. And that's because there is a physical barrier between the circulation 
in the peritoneum. That's called the plasma peritoneal partition. And um, honestly, having peritoneal carcinomatosis is a bad way to die, right? I mean, it's a tough way to die. Patients get obstructed, they get malnourished, and do they have a lot of pain associated with that. So the first way to evaluate this in a very well setting was for us to create a murine model of peritoneal surface disease. Okay. And so I took the CT26 colon cancer cell lines that we talked about and established them in a syngenetic model, a model that has an intact immune system, okay, and put them in the peritoneum. So what you'll see here in A, excuse me, what you'll see in B is this is a human setting as we showed before, lots of tumors everywhere. This is the murine setting, the mouse setting, in my lab. Again, tumors in the abdomen, okay? So it looks like it works, okay? It looks like that model works. Now the interesting thing that we have done, and we'll show some of this data a little later, is that we transfected these tumor cell lines in mice with luciferase, which allows tumors to light up when we put them under a special scanner, okay? Now the first question is, is what happens to the growth of tumor, intraperitoneal tumor, when it's treated with M51R virus? Shown here in the red are animals that are treated with M51R virus over 6 to 16 days on the x-axis and on the y-axis is luminescence. And luminescence is, again, the production of light by tumor cells that have been transfected with luciferase. Or luciferin, rather. And what we'll see here over, and these are five representative mice of 10, is that we didn't have a lot of tumor production here. We did not have a lot of luminescent tumor here. Okay. Now, for animals that underwent mock treatment, i.e. injections with saline, they had a lot of luminescence. And the difference in luminescence was evidenced by day nine and increased throughout the duration of the experiment. And again, five representative mice of 10, so that you had a lot of luminescence in these animals, okay? So these data would suggest that intraperitoneal M51RVSV can effectively um, reduce the growth of tumors in mice with intact immune systems. So does this impact survival? Okay, and so we did a second experiment with the same mouse model in which we treated mice with M51R virus and then there were some that were mock treated. We took this out to 22 days, excuse me, 30 days and what we saw was that the median survival for animals that were treated with saline alone was about 22 days. And then for animals that were treated with M51R virus, the median survival was not reached. In other words, there was a clinically statistically, a clinically statistically significant difference in mice that were treated with saline compared to those that were treated with M51R virus. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. So what we wanted to do then was we wanted to identify the activation of anti-tumor immunity that, that potentially led to this um, improvement, okay? So shown here is a scheme in which animals uh, were treated with um, CT26 tumor cells, okay? And then we imaged the mice, you know, four days later to make sure the tumor was growing. And then on day zero, we treated with 10 to the 8 platforming units of N51R virus with treatment group, or um, PBS, and the control group. And on days one, three, and seven, we sacrificed the mice into peritoneal washings so that we can look at <coughs> anti-tumor and pro-tumor cytokines, as well as um, anti-tumor and pro-tumor um, immune responses via flow cytometry. Okay, and so this is just basically a quick scheme of how we identified these cells. Okay, so it's all the cells that were CD45 positive, and then we broke them down to CD11 positivity, and then did a number of stains in order to define these populations. So. Because we only used eight flow color cytometry, you know, we did not have extremely, um, extremely specific findings. I will tell you now um, that under Duke we have a 50 channel flow cytometer, so we're able to identify individual cell populations um, across broad uh, samples. But what we'll see here, um, just really quickly, is that treatment um, with M51R virus on day seven actually caused a statistically significant increase in CD4 populations with a p-value of 0.004. We saw that our myeloid lineage cells uh, were statistically significant. However, I think that there's this one outlier that made it um, significant, but if you look at the means, they're about the same. 
Now, one interesting thing that I'll point to you, point out to you, is that with our B1B cell populations, um, there was by day seven a statistically significantly higher proportion of B1B cells in those animals treated with N51R virus relative to mock treated animals. That's a very interesting story. Okay? So the story around B1B, or the developing story around B1B now, is that B1B cells are actually the, um, the immune policemen of the peritoneum. Okay, again, this has been found to happen in ovarian cancer. We're starting to be able to tell a story in colon cancer. Whereas B1B cells take up antigen, and then they're able, these B cells are able to mature and actually kill tumor cells. Okay? So not only produce antibodies, but actually kill tumor cells. This is really bad transposition here. Okay, so um, just in this transposition, whoa, okay. So what we saw was that our myeloid lineage cells uh, increased. Um, our myeloid-derived uh, suppressor cell populations uh, showed that we had fewer suppressor cells in our M51R virus populations than we did with our mock-treated cells. Now, myeloid suppressor cells are important because they actually inhibit anti-tumor immunity. And so the virus is able to drive down the myeloid suppressor cells, um, which again is very important anti-tumor immunity. Now, when we did a uh, profile of supernatants to look for cytokines that were associated with anti-tumor immunity, we um, had an interesting finding, and that is that you know MCP1 was found to be statistically significant by day seven, and MCP1 um, is actually uh, shown to be an important modulator in anti-tumor immunity, and IL-6 in uh, mox or treated cells are actually lower. And we now think that IL-6 is actually an anti-tumor cytokine, excuse me, is an anti-immune cytokine. And so again, we're kind of taking the brakes off the immune system in this um, treatment. So our current concept, conceptual framework for research moving forward is that when we treat CT26 tumor cells, as is shown here, with M51R virus, we have an activation of innate and adaptive immunity. Um, and this anti-tumor response is probably related to the induction of anti-tumor CD4, um, anti-tumor B1B cells, and the activation of macrophages. Pro-tumor response, again, we still are working on understanding this myeloid-derived suppressor cell uh, story, which is very interesting. The reduction of regulatory T cells, and also the reduction of pro-tumor cytokines, such as IL-6. Now, one thing that I think is really important for us to do moving forward, particularly in this era of personalized medicine, is to understand biomarkers that will allow us to uh, talk to a patient about the likelihood of response to a particular therapy. Okay? Now, the way to really do that, at least in the early discovery uh, stage of some drugs, is to test against patient tumors. Okay? And so what we have done is that we've created a number of uh, panels of patients' tumors with peritoneal carcinomatosis. Um, and, and we did this when I was at Lake, so this is patient 18, this is patient 26, in which we grew tumors on um, radiated fibroblasts using conditioned media with rho kinase inhibitors, as was reported by Dick Slagle's group at um, Georgetown. And then we treated again for 24, 48, and 72 hours with increasing concentrations of vesicular stomatitis virus. Isn't that surprising? Some are sensitive and some are resistant. Okay? Some are sensitive and some are resistant. So what we're going to do moving forward is to continue to grow these cell lines, uh, but then we'll, we'll uh, start looking at using next-gen sequencing um, in collaboration with David Shi, who's, who's at Duke now in uh, medical oncology, to see if we can identify biomarkers for response moving forward. Okay? So future directions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you Tell us or give us or your opinion. There's a uh, product out there on the market for colon cancer mm -hmm. identification. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm referring to? The, I mean, seen it advertised on TV. It's something you order. Your doctor orders. They send it to you. You put your sample. Okay. So, the, so there. So, do you mean for the detection of colon cancer? Yeah, fecal occult. Okay, yeah. Right. So, yeah, so there's the, the fecal occult blood test that, you know, 
We have, um, like, when your doctor do that, does a... I don't think it's a blood test. This is, I think, you put a stool. Okay. A stool. Right. So, yeah, so there's, so there's a methylated DNA test that's out there where they can actually look at your stool to see, um, to look for methylation, um, or hypomethylation, excuse me, to, to look at, to predict whether or not you have cancer there. I will tell you that... Um, are there markers similar to what you're talking about? No, the, the markers are different. I think the markers are different, and you know, I mean, as we progress, they might end up being the same. But right now, what we're doing is that we're trying to identify which patients who already have colon cancer will have tumors that are more susceptible to the virus. Okay. Now, I will say, just kind of as a public service plug, um, and, and I think most of you in this audience probably don't need to hear it, but there are some of us with gray hair that do need to hear it. Um, and then, by the way, when my parents friends turned 50, they all hated me, because I told them they all needed their screening colonoscopies, okay? So, I mean, to me, yeah, it's cool to get your fecal blood test done every, you know, 10 years, but you've got to have your, your sigmoidoscopy done every five or your full colon exam done every 10. Um, you have to be religious about that, okay? I mean, that's, that, that, that's, that's extremely important, okay? So, future plans, number one. Um, we're going to really work to define the mechanisms of the qualitative and quantitative changes in uh, tumor immunity and the peritoneum that I showed you before when we flow cytometry. As was mentioned before, we're going to look at specific pro-tumor and anti-tumor immune responses using some pretty cool uh, technology that's available at Duke to, um, to increase and decrease gene production um, to, again, look to see if we can look at specific biomarkers that would pretend um, that we'll be able to identify responsiveness to BSV. And then we'll look at potential targets to see if we can create combination therapies. You know, do CTLA-4 inhibitors plus vesicular stomatitis virus improve immunologic outcomes? There's some of the mechanisms for BSV improve outcomes. So we'll look at those to see if we can provide um, more exciting options for this population of patients who have very few options at this point. So, again, I'd like to thank you for uh, your attention. Again, appreciate, always appreciate coming down the road to A&T, and I'd like to open the floor for questions. On the, uh, the colonoscopy thing, uh, mm -hmm. statement that you're making the discussion you were having, uh, is there, has anyone ever conceived or done para Tonioscopy. I mean, yeah. some sort of a diagnostic with a, I don't know what it would be, some camera or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So laparoscopy to, to look at the peritoneum. Yeah, it's um, a diagnostic. Yeah, it's kind of a screening or? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. maybe for a screening as an alternative yeah. or an add-on to the uh, colonoscopy. So, so that's a fairly invasive undertaking, you know, high, um, high resource. You, know, you got to get an OR, you got to get a surgeon, you got to stick a camera in. No, by the way. There is, albeit small, risk of stuff happening during laparoscopy. So the vast majority of these patients actually have peritoneal surface dissemination discovered during screening. So if you've got a colon cancer, you know, you get your screening work up um, and you know, you'll see peritoneal stuff. Yeah, so yeah, so that's, you know, that again is a, is a less kind of intense resource situation. Now, you know, the second end of that is we know that Sometimes um, CAT scans don't have the resolution to identify all peritoneal disease, um, but there's not any evidence that shows that you know discovery of disease at the laparoscopy stage versus the CAT scan actually impacts outcome. Okay, so right now you know the, the current thought is that complete cytoreduction reduction or complete removal of tumor at the time of operation is what gives you your best chance of outcome as opposed to extremely early diagnosis. Well, for, on the malignancy process, is there a reason to expect, say, uh, for, colon, for uh, colon cancer that uh, uh, becomes malignant, and goes, uh, that it actually starts in the colon and goes to the peritoneum, or could it be going the other way? Typically, it starts in the colon and goes to the peritoneum. Oh, okay. So, uh, working on uh, adoptive T-cell therapy so for a while, and with the recent grant, the problem for the, the T-cell therapy is uh, very short, like, lifetime. Uh, 
So once you inject into the T cells and pass T cells to the body, yeah. uh, it didn't like uh, persist for a long time, yeah. so you have to inject again. And mm -hmm. What about this uh, bar of the I mean, like, uh, is it going yeah. to persist so for a long time in the yes. body? Yeah, so that, that's the that's great thing about this. And shout out to the T cells, like I said, I worked with Steve Rosenberg for four years and you know, I, I became a T cell chauvinist. Um, the thing about the virus is that the virus replicates with the tumor. And so, you know, our early studies showed that when we did serial resection of tumors in mice over the you know, days that we still had the we still had the presence of M protein, excuse me, G protein, which is part of the BSV genome. So that, that's the thing that, to me, is, is so much more interesting. Now, with respect to your T cell persistence, um, you know, typically when they do um, T cell transplants, T cell infusions, there's a conditioning regimen that happens so that they knock down the body's innate immune system. I also think that they've done, well, I know that they also knock down um, suppressor T cells. And then, therefore, that creates room and it creates a nice environment for the T cells to grow. But you're right, just T cells kind of floating out, you know, they get picked up by the spleen, they get picked up by the liver. Um, so that, that's a challenge. It's a big challenge. The, the, the same way, I mean, like, uh, like uh, uh, maybe uh, this, uh, the virus can treat the cancer at a certain point, but mm -hmm. at the same time, you are boosting the immune system in your body. Right. And any any possible side effect at the long term, like uh, mm -hmm. that all the, mm -hmm. the the immune system is start to attack the whole. And so um, that's a great question. So this, so there are just several parts to that question. So one part that as I tease it out is again that's what makes this attractive is that you're not only blowing up the cancer cells but you're also priming the immune cells um, so that you've got interferon production, you've got loading of the dead tumor cells, we call those apoptotic bodies, um, onto antigen-presenting cells and subsequently activating T cells, both CD4 and CD8, you've got activation of the native immunity. So that I think is a great part of this. Now, with respect to the second part, I'll draw on my experience, clinical experience in herpes virus, is that um, some people will have um, an effect related to oncolytic virus that's basically you know, a low grade um, systemic inflammatory response that's expected, right? I mean, they have myalgias, they might have fevers, all that stuff self limiting resolves within 72 hours with Tylenol. So, yeah, you do get an immune response. And if you get a neutralizing immune response, you know, that, that's again a great question that people are beginning to um, ask whether or not you should do a viral switch off. In other words, you know, should you treat with VSV for a little bit and then switch to like herpes simplex virus on the back end so that you don't have um, anti-tumor immunity or antiviral immunity that um, moves your viral effect away. One last question sure. is, uh, again, so we are A&E, and we don't have bad scores, and mm -hmm. some students are really struggling with the limited resource, so you can able to provide a sample of library, the future I mean, again, you're helping to last like of years. <laughs> I mean, if you can help others uh, and, and real risk to like, uh, yeah. so, yeah. so um, that to me is an important part of why it's important for, for programs to have clinical links. Um, so probably something for us to kind of talk about a little bit down the road beyond the, the scope of this. But yeah, we'd be happy to try to facilitate that. Um, it was interesting that the part about how uh, the left lateral treated the effects on the right as well. Yes. Uh, is it, did you have to try a case where you injected the virus not in the tumor, just in the animal, anywhere, away from the tumor, and, yeah. and it still has the effect? Yeah. So that is, uh, that's been a challenge for a little bit. So that's why, like, systemic treatment with uh, oncolytic virus doesn't work because it gets cleared by the body's reticular endocyst, like the RES, and the spleen, it gets cleared by the liver, so it never reaches the tumor. That's why we've always been geared toward giving intratumoral injections. And one other question on that, a lot of the uh, kind of measurements are growth of tumors. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any evidence that the uh, treatments that you're working on mm -hmm. would potentially decrease a tumor that's already big? Yeah, so, um, so what we've shown, at least again in the peritoneal model, was that, well, let me take it back. So for the first paper that we published back looking at our just blanket models, we did show some reduction in tumor. 
But again, because we reported out across 10 and 15 animals, you know, that ended up being a pretty much flat volume line. To me, the growth of tumors is important because that's really what we're, we're looking at, right? I mean, when you're looking at a peritoneal model of tumor, you know, you can't go in and just measure the tumor. You just can't measure it, right? Because it's disseminated. So that's why we use a, a kind of a, a collapse measure of something like bioluminescence, right? Because that kind of speaks to us as to the volume of tumor. And again, because those bioluminescence uh, planes are flat, or those curves are flat, we, we consider that to be a good therapeutic effect. That was a question here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going to ask a similar question, but also, um, so pretty much you're using the virus to infect the cancer cells, and the yes. cancer cells um, pretty much die off and it's elective that way. How, um, how long does the um, auto tumor response last? Or is it going to be like something that has to be like reintroduced? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so for herpes virus, you know, we reintroduce. You know, first we introduce every three weeks what we do day one. Then three weeks later we do the second injection. Then two weeks we do the third injections. Mm -hmm. So some people would think that that's the way to, to go with that virus. At least in these models, we don't have to retreat. You know, we see a nice effect. Um, you know, down the road, we'll look at retreatment, but we'll look at retreatment in the context of um, establishing long-term anti-tumor immunity, i.e. more than 30 days, but understanding what happens at 60, 90, 120 days in these animals. Um, so, so that type of model would, would work. Um, now, the other thing, too, is that um, most of these animals will have really great effect where you don't have tumor to, to re-inject. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that, that just really speaks to, again, the long-term effects, immune effects mm -hmm. of, the, of the virus. Mm -hmm. this one, okay. uh, I have a, a big question here. Is, um, uh, you said that uh, the viruses are very effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, if the virus or immune system will trigger later on, uh, what about the non-viral things, uh, uh, injecting in a blood stream and having a tumor? You said it's, it's never reached to the tumor site yeah, and uh, yeah. it's not effective. Great. Uh, but based on these recent things, a uh, lot of things happening in the nanotechnology, mm -hmm. nanoparticles, that targetable delivery. Yeah. This uh, new technology are not meeting those. So we have long, um, kind of a long-held truth in the treatment of peritoneal surface dissemination is the peritoneal plasma partition. And so there is a partition that's related to the size of molecules um, that, you know, the larger the molecule, it can't transverse the peritoneum, or it can't tra yeah, transverse the peritoneum to get into the peritoneal cavity. Now, fortunately, that, unfortunately, that size is small enough to include most chemotherapeutic agents, definitely most viruses. And so um, they aren't really great systemic options. Now, with respect to nanotech, um, and you know, I, I used to swim in the nanotech waters more so than I do now, you know, doing systemic injections of nanotechs, it's dicey, right? It's, we still don't know how we eliminate nanoparticles, and we still don't know what the long-term effects are. Um, you know, we do know that the stuff get clear, gets cleared, right? It gets cleared. Um, but you know, nanoparticles aren't going to transverse um, from a systemic injection into the peritoneum. Now, a local injection, you know, maybe, okay? So, you know, back in the day when I was doing carbon wall nanotechnology with, with Nicole, you know, we, we saw that there was some effect, but again, carbon nano isn't really vogue much anymore, so she's using quantum dots and, and important things like those in order to deliver local therapy. There are some uh, nanos, uh, there is a, uh, I mean, the, they are re degradable over time. They yeah. clear. Yeah. It's not permanent nano. Some of them are reservable. Yeah. Maybe that's a. Yeah, but yeah. So again, the, the I guess the issue is, and again, moving that from a preclinical to a clinical setting is, you know, how does it cross the peritoneum? Does it cross the peritoneum? Um, now, with respect to the other part of the question around using non-viral agents that are injected systemically, you know. I told you we used to have this long-held thought that stuff doesn't go from the bloodstream into the peritoneum. Um, there was a trial that looked at some of the um, newer targeted therapies 
systemic injections to see if there was an effect in the uh, peritoneum, and that was published by Aaron Blackham, and it was done in collaboration between Wake and, um, and MD Anderson. It must have been about five or six years ago. So some yes, some no. <laughs> you know? So again, nothing definitive there, nothing definitive there. Now, there are some patients who will present with advanced peritoneal disease that might not necessarily be in good enough shape to undergo an operation. So those patients will get some chemotherapy up front, okay? To, number one, allow for the treatment of other disease that might be present outside of the peritoneum, to give them time to kind of get better energy levels, improve their nutrition, optimize them for surgery. Um, and so those patients will get some upfront therapy. But in general, you know, for colorectal cancer, um, you know, for high-grade tumors, again, that's done primarily to, to get people up to speed for an operation. Student questions? So you're saying that the uh, virus is too big to be transported through nanoparticles or like microbubbles or something like that? Well, like I said, the, the problem is that the virus won't go from like the bloodstream into the peritoneum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it won't go from the bloodstream to the peritoneum. So that's why we have to do direct infiltration or direct delivery of the virus into the peritoneum. Okay. Now, again, the virus, so when I kind of think of nanoparticles in terms of delivery, which I, th which I think is where you're getting at. You know, yeah. we, 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 you know, the viruses, we've got the viruses as an effective delivery agent, right? I mean, you can, you can inject the virus. I mean, even in the peritoneum, you can just inject into the peritoneum, and then it'll attack the, the cancer cells that are studying the peritoneum. Okay. So, yeah, so we've got a great delivery option there. So, you know, we don't need a payload mechanism by which to get it there. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, he's, he shared his cards, and I have a couple left. If anyone's interested, just let me know. Yeah. Well, that's two. We've got them. Thank you so much. Please drop your surveys off with uh, Dr. Meister. Thank you. I'll see you on the Like, go lunch with us? Thank you. 